about expanding our land base by making our root zone deep work and increasing our yield. And by the way, let's stop running, you know, stop some of these runoff issues and some of these other things we've got to think about agriculture. So I think of this as a portable expansion. We're going to deepen up that root zone. We're going to increase that soil quality. We're going to do it with steady investment instead of going to the banker and borrowing more money. I think there's a high potential for cost control to think about in addition to the, the potential for good yields, probably better yields than what we get with these real conventional farms as long as we're practicing these things over time and practicing them consistently. And folks, I think this is the golden age of crop production. We have more tools in our toolbox than our grandfathers and fathers could dream of. Uh, the genetics, I think, really proved themselves this year. You talk to guys who went through the 88 drought and went through this year, and it was night and day. And that's that's genetics right there. Uh, we've got not only got the genetically modified crops, but we've got what's called marker-assisted breeding, where by knowing the crop genome, we're able to accelerate the pace of crop breeding and even livestock breeding uh, to a tremendous degree. The equipment, you know, we've got things like think about row clutches, think about uh, GPS, RTK guidance. These things that again have made our, our, our cropping systems more efficient and, and more accurate. Uh, precision Ag, we're going to talk a lot about in this, and we're going to talk about remote sensing using satellites, using drone aircraft, uh, using uh, uh, real time analysis of the colors of crops in order to adjust our, our nutrients on the fly. I think uh, any of us who get to ride around on open station tractors still compare that to the you know an air conditioned you know vibration damping cab that we have today, I think comfort and safety is way up too. We've got what I call the internet extension agents. You got a question, fire up Google. It's in there. And you know, I think all of this really leads to conservation uh, that really works well. Where do I want you to set your yields? Let's set them high. Let's set our yield goal high. 300 bushel corn, 100 bushel soybeans. I used to think about 100 bushel wheat, then I heard Phil Needham talking about 200 bushel wheat, so I, I revised that up. Uh, why, why do we have to set these yield targets so high? Well, you know, I think this last year was a good object lesson why. You know, we, we've got this 9 billion people we're going to have to feed by the middle of the century. We've got demand for biofuels, sucking up some of that grain we used to. We've got a hugely high global grain price, and that doesn't seem to be coming down. We've had regional crop figures, really spectacular places. Think of the, the figure of the Russian wheat crop a few years ago. We've got this UG99 uh, stem rust coming out of Africa, raising cane in the Punjab region. That's a wonderful stable region that includes you know, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we really, as farmers, need to be thinking about getting our game up just to deal with some of these things that are coming on. And we've got global water issues. And we've got water issues right in this country. We, you know, think about the Ogallala Aquifer, which has dropped considerably out west because of irrigation. All of these things are conspiring to, make, to, to really demand that we get our game up throughout the industry in order to get those yield goals that we've got. How are we going to do that? We're going to do it with soil health. Uh, and I think porosity is something I'm going to talk about quite a bit. Um, you know, the ideal soil, if you will, is kind of 50% soil and dirt, 25% uh, air, 25% water. And by kind of shooting for this target, we again are, are going to increase that soil health. High populations of soil life. And this is going to lead to a natural, highly cyclical, uh, of nitrogen to use, and it's also going to consume that residue rapidly. And later on, we're going to we're going to tap the knowledge in this room to talk about how the heck do you break down these modern corn stalks? Because that's I, I would I would dare say that is one of the biggest challenges in row crop production agriculture is dealing with corn residue these days. Lots of hungry critters in that soil does a good job of breaking that down quickly. Um, high organic matter, we've got a water and nutrient pooling capacity. Balanced nutrients, you know, I can't, I, we're, we're going to talk about this as we go through, but let's not get too far, you know, too much of any one nutrient in there, and let's not, you know, leave money on the table because we're not feeding these crops enough either. Uh, think about not only your macronutrients, N, P, and K, but your secondary nutrients, sulfur, magnesium, and calcium, and also micronutrients. You know, I think we're increasingly realizing that, that some of our crops are coming up a little short on zinc, on iron. These are things we can deal with right at planting and, and deal with them, especially if you've got excesses. And again, we'll talk about this as we go. I think we're, we need to think about correcting pH, especially that last time before you park that chisel plow permanently. We need to stir a little more lime into that deep root zone. Uh, 
we can address these excesses, like I was saying, because it, we actually see situations where if we've got a real high excess of a nutrient, we may actually be tying up things. Phosphorus and zinc is a good example. If the phosphorus has gotten way out of whack on your farm because of heavy manure spreading, you may be wanting to get some zinc, get some iron in that soil right down the row to make up for that binding effect. Um, my, my mentor Gary Zimmer refers to this soil as chocolate cake. It's moist, it's sticky, it's dark brown, and it's high in sugar. And the sugars lead to things like uh, polysaccharides, glomulins that lead to aggregate stability. Uh, Paul was just telling me we're actually going to be able to do some demonstrations about showing you what that high aggregate stability looks like in your fields and some tests we can do. We're going to look at good yields and tough conditions like we had last year and great yields when we have a good year. We're all probably pretty familiar with this, you know, with this little diagram here, you know, the, the sand silt clay triangle. That's really going to define the inherent capacity of your soil. And that's why we have these, this expectation that on a heavier soil we're going to be able to have higher yields, where on a sand we might have to back off on population of nutrients a little bit. Because the inherent capacity to yield is just, just is not there. And there's also some differences in how we're going to manage the soil or some, some of the advantages you're going to see from some of the things I'm going to suggest. You know, on a real heavy clay soil like this, building pores is a real challenge. We're down here in the sand like I deal with, you know, pore, pore space is not your problem. Pore space, so, you know, like I said, sand's got plenty of that. We don't have to think about that a lot with sand. It's difficult to compact sand so much that it won't drain. We're making uh, pores and clay is more challenging. And a lot of our, our farmers, unfortunately, because their soil texture or their soil quality is not so good, they get in there and they make that pore on an annual basis by chisel plowing the dickens out of it, really stirring it. And in the long term, that's actually counterproductive. And it, it's kind of counterintuitive, you think, if I stop stirring that soil, my pore space is going to disappear, it's going to compact, it's going to get real hard, I'm not going to get the air in it anymore, my yields are going to drop. And in the short run, that may be true. You may actually have some porosity problems in the, in the short term. However, in the long term, less tillage equals more pores. We're going to talk about how those pores develop and, and why you want to think about maybe getting out of that lower root zone or going to continuous no-till entirely to, to get that pore space. What makes pores? Worms are a big one, especially the macro pores. You know, those, those worms going up and down and making those channels are huge. Freeze and thaw has a modest effect, especially in the, in the upper root zone. It certainly can do a lot to break out some of that shallow compaction over time. We'll talk a little bit about cation effects, the effect of calcium may have on your soil. Organic matter is huge. The, the ability of organic matter to complex with clay makes a big difference in being, being able to open that clay up and get those pores established over time. And, you know, like I said, we need to start thinking about short-term pores versus long-term pores, deep pores versus shallow pores, and you need to understand what's going to happen as we reduce tillage over time and how long are, are we going to have to be patient to get that, that pore structure we want in there. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this as we go along. You may be familiar with GAMP's Journal of Accepted Agricultural Management Practices. This is basically what's allowed and what's not allowed in the state of Michigan. Um, we have very strict GAMP's about direct flows of manure through tile. And a lot of our guys, I think, are, are out there in the fields. They're chiseling aggressively to break macro pores because they're concerned that they're going to lose manure out, out the bottom of the tiles. And I would suggest that we need to think about either other ways of preventing that tile flow, or we need to you know, maybe get on our guys in Lansing and give our farmers a little more flexibility so that you know, if a little bit of manure squirts out the tile, they're not going to get hammered with that. And in exchange, over time, we're going to get better soil structure, and I would argue less runoff over time, less of a problem. You got a controversy there on the north end of the hill in certain areas. You spread it out, you've got so many hours to get that incorporated. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about what the GAMPs actually say as we go along here. So just hold that thought because it's, I, I think it's a critical thing to think about. I, I'm right there with you. And it's, you know, it's the one everybody worries about because that's the one, you know, the Sierra Club and the other kind of anti-ag people are on the floor is if, you know, the food food comes out of the tile, you know, let's get the big hammer out and drop it on this guy. Organic matter is great stuff, and that's largely because carbon is such an interesting molecule. If you, if you remember from chemistry, carbon can make four covalent bonds. It's the only uh, 
molecule on that whole periodic table that could do that. Because carbon is so integral to life and you know throughout our soil, it really really makes a huge difference. You know, the more carbon we can get in that soil, the better. And that, that's almost universally true. Uh, it leads to more cation exchange capacity, that's the ability of our soils to hold uh, nutrients. Cation exchange capacity is also a, a good proxy to understand how much water the soil can hold. So basically, as that CEC is climbing, as that organic metal level is climbing, you can count on more available nutrients and you can count on more available water over time. In addition to the, you know, the porosity and the ability of that water to actually penetrate the soil during the rain event. So I really encourage you to track that organic matter content over time. And I'd like you to set a goal for yourself. Tenth of a point a year, at least. If you're not climbing a tenth of a point a year, you really ought to be asking yourself why. And if your organic matter level is dropping, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. There are many forms of organic matter. It goes everything from you know, the crispy bits on top to things like humic and fulvic acids that are very active chemically in our soil. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different form out there, but if we're taking our soil tests correctly and kind of scraping that residue off the top, you know, that last little bit on top, you should get a pretty good accurate uh, idea. <clears throat> At some point, maybe, we'll also see direct payments for accumulated carbon in the soil. We saw a decent market for that a few years ago. That kind of collapsed as the cap and trade thing started becoming less popular and less globally applied. But I think eventually we're going to see that. Um, I throw this in there because a lot of people haven't heard of this yet, and it's really kind of a neat thing, and, and especially as I've seen so much of our, our kind of secondary lands being, you know, where the trees get piled up and burned. You know, I wish people were, if somebody would be building these things, a biochar reactor, going out and making biochar out of that instead. Biochar is where we take some kind of high carbon and something, something, crop residue, wood chips, whatever, you heat it, but you don't burn it. Basically, get rid of the volatile fraction on there, the, what we, we call volatile organic compounds. Think uh, turpentines, light hardware, hydrocarbons, that kind of stuff. We get rid of all of that. We can either burn it if it's on a small scale. On a factory scale, we might actually strip that out and sell that to chemical factories. And what we're left over with is this highly porous carbon, highly stable carbon. Um, and it, it, it's really kind of the express train to carbon farming. If we've got really low organic matter soils, now, I think over time we're going to see more of this stuff readily available and we'll, we'll see more of this going into the soil. But the guys who are messing around with this really are getting fantastic results and it's a way to kind of take the express train to carbon farming. So it's another good one to, to Google. Uh, this book by Albert Bates, I know Albert from uh, uh, some different conferences and things going on. He's really a big proponent of this and, and has written a really interesting book on that one. I, I, I like to you guys to get some books. Okay, how many people are farmers in here? How many farmers we got? All right, how many people are livestock farmers? <coughs> Actually, all of you, if you farm, are livestock farmers. The soil microbes, the insects, the earthworms, they need care and feeding, just like your cows, your pigs, your, your goats, your sheep. And the better job we do of, of caring for and feeding them, the, the better job we're going to do getting that soil life up, the better job they're going to do for you over time. Um, you should keep in mind, as we're if we're in a building phase, we're trying to build up that, that underground livestock, if you will, those guys are made out of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, all of that stuff that, that makes up living organisms. And they eat first. They eat before your crop seed. So if we're in a building phase, we may need to change our nutrient application strategies a little bit to make sure that there's sufficient nutrients in that soil, build those up, and feed your crops at the same time, and particularly with nitrogen. We're going to talk about that quite a bit as we go along. And that's one of the, the, the reasons we sometimes see that yield drag when people go to continuous no-till, is these microbes are sucking up that nitrogen, and it, when you're in that building phase, you just might need to throw a little more nitrogen at it as you go. Uh, our management choices really affect these soil microbes, tillage especially, but also residue coverage, how much residue we're leaving out there, um, and cover crops. Cover crops are really interesting because whenever you've got a green plant growing on that soil, not only is it covering the soil from erosion, what we primarily think of cover crops doing, but it's also actually pumping sugars and other nutrients into the soil to feed the soil life 
to get their symbiotic, to get a symbiotic relation, relationship going in there. And certainly the soil texture, the chemistry of the soil, where the nutrient levels are at, and the drainage are all going to have effects as you try to build more soil life as you go along. This is just kind of a nice diagram of, of what's going on in, in that soil as you go along. And certainly not everything we're, we're thrilled to have uh, building up populations. You know, if we're getting lots of slugs and snails, we might have problems. But most of the other stuff you see on this pattern, those are all your allies. Those are all your workers out there to do the, the things we need to do on, on the farm every day. Um, there's another thing going on. Protozoa, they may, in the roundworms, they're eating the bacteria. Well, those protozoa are maybe uh, one part carbon to, or, or you know, one part nitrogen to 40 part carbon. So those bacteria are about one part to 10 parts carbon. What that means is that when that protozoa eats a bacteria, it pees out some nitrogen for you. And this kind of interaction and this, this predation and, and excretion is where that kind of pool of available nitrogen comes from in the soil. So as we get a stable population of, these, of this soil life, we actually get a kind of circulating uh, nutrient pool going in there. And that's, that's kind of important, and that's where some of our yield advantage is going to come from. Fungi are particularly important when we're talking about not only uh, breaking down of residues, because fungi are kind of uniquely suited for breaking down portions of that, of those, uh, of that residue, especially Lincoln. Lingon is very difficult to degrade, except by fungi. So by getting our, our level of fungi up there, we can actually get some of that breakdown of, of, of residue more effectively. Lingon is very structurally stiff. And if we're thinking about these corn residues that are, are hard to break down, everybody wants to blame the BT gene. I think it's more standability. If you've got these high standability corns, you know, I think it's more that linkage going on in the lack of fungi that's causing some of these residue management problems. Uh, the other thing that goes on over time is that fungi put out what are called hyphae. Think of them as roots. These hyphal networks go out to the soil and they provide a couple of services to us. Not only do they provide a little more support when we're going across the field with our heavy equipment, but that those networks actually pull nutrients into the crops. So that's why the crops bother to you know, push these sugars down to the ground to feed these fungi because especially these mycorrhizal fungi will actually sometimes grow right into the cellular structure of the plants where they'll colonize the outside of the root. Both these and this, this uh, hyphal network pull more water, pull more nutrients into our crops and that's why over time as these fungal networks build up we're able to maybe dial down some of our, our nutrient uh, applications because we've actually got essentially a bigger root system just waiting there to, to kind of latch onto your crops when they, when they get in there. Anytime we get in there and we till that deep root zone, that middle root zone, we're going to break that fungal hyphae and reset it. So if we can go to a continuous no-till or some kind of conservation tillage, over time we're going to see that fungal fungi really flourish. Uh, earthworms are another kind of class of, of organisms in the soil that are very important. These guys get in there and they basically make macrophores for free. Uh, you got a couple of different groups of these. You got these deep burrowers, like the night crawlers, we're all pretty familiar with them. They grow wasp fellows, they go down several feet, they live for several years, and they'll actually pull that, uh, pull those residues down into the soil for you and get them off the surface. That's great. I mean, that pulls that organic matter down deep in the soil. And it also allows uh, water to, to get down to the soil more effectively. You've got surface dwellers, red wigglers are the ones we're all familiar with, you know, the ones who go out and roll over some leaves in the forest to pick up for fishing. And these kind of middle soil dwellers that are moving more, or more horizontally in the soil, you got to kind of dig them up to go look at farm. All of them are valuable for us, all of them do great things, and you know, I think that again, they kind of make a good proxy for soil health getting out there and seeing a lot of castings, you go out after the rain and you see lots of, lots of worms around on the soil, it's a pretty good indicator you've got a pretty healthy soil. You know, this is what I like to say, soil life isn't free, but it's cheap, and it works for you over time. Uh, you know, keep in mind, like I said, the microbes are going to eat first, we got to compensate there for that early on, and when we get into talking about uh, nutrient management, we'll kind of talk about how. 
takes three to five years, maybe more, to reach a stable population of soil life if we're starting from, from a relatively low population. And, and this is one of the things that I, I think the no-till guys find frustrating when they, they kind of talk to their neighbors and maybe try it for a few years. The neighbors don't see it, you know, turn around in a heartbeat, they get frustrated, out comes a chisel plow again and they reset the whole system. And then and no-till's a big failure. Well, I think that's more a failure of patience and maybe than, than a failure of no-till per se. But if we can be patient and we can get through this building phase, you know, we're putting some of these nutrients into what I like to think of as a savings account. And you know, we talked a little about that cycle of predation. As that uh, population becomes stable, then that cycle of predation is releasing uh, uh, nitrogen throughout the season. And the nice thing is that steady release of nitrogen is going to provide that nitrogen when the grain is filling. You know, it's, if, if you look, especially at corn, you know, we're, we're always trying to get out there, we're trying to throw that nitrogen on either right at planting or maybe side dressing a month later. When's the, when's the plant really need it the most? It really, six weeks later, seven weeks, eight weeks later? You know, and we can go after that. I suppose we could go, you know, put it on with a high boy, we could put it on with a real tall sprayer, da 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 da. Well, if we've already got it in the stable situation in the ground, I think we can get away with putting that pop-up on and not worry so much about having that, about feeding that nitrogen uh, from the co-op. We can just have it there in the soil, circulating and, and ready for the use. The other thing, uh, you know, we was kind of looking online to figure out, you know, what, what can we credit? You know, how, how can we kind of put a number on that? We all like to put numbers on these things. And kind of what I came up with is you can figure about there's about 20 pounds to the acre of nitrogen available for every percent of organic matter. Now, I think that may be a little higher. Other people think it's a little lower. But again, I think the, the real important take home message is that it's there when you really need it. Um, I'd also like people to think of what's that, what's that residue really? That's per acre, you say? Yeah, 20, 20 pounds per acre per percent of organic matter. Uh, I'd also like us to, to really start thinking about what that residue is really worth. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking all the time. We're always, you know, three years out from cellulosic ethanol. And every more stock in America is going to be needed for, for ethanol production. Fortunately, we're still three years out, and we've been that way for about 10 years. And as far as I'm concerned, it could just stay the hell away. Because as soon as all those corn stalks start going to the factory to make cellulosic ethanol, I'm really curious about what the heck is going to hold our soils in place. And when the, when the ethanol man comes to your farm and knocks on the door and says, hey, I'll pay you, you know, 10 bucks a ton for your, your, for your residues, really ask yourself, what's it worth? You know, there's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, carbon, you know, water holding capacity, feed for your critters. Boy, I'll tell you what, you better get plenty of money for that residue if you're going to sell it. Um, this vertical expansion, I think, can really be thought of as just this building of soil life. you got to feed them to breed them. Put the crop residue on there, put the cover crops on there, get some manure out there if you can. Diversify your crop rotation if you can. If you're a cash grain farmer, I especially think you need to start thinking about diversifying that rotation as much as possible. Think about the different classes of plants out there. Uh, you know, cool season grasses, warm season grasses, corn, uh, cool season broadleaves, uh, uh, like uh, uh, brassicas, warm season broadleaves, uh, buckwheat. There's all this diversity you can put in the rotation. Can we double crop a little more than, than we have in the past? But you know, the real take home message is keep something green on that soil just as long as you can every season. Uh, lower your disturbance to the soil, will burn the organic matter, matter with tillage, will break the fungal highway. Don't lose those pores that you spend so much time make, making, especially in clay. Uh, if you can't stand the idea of going no-till, maybe you've got too much manure to deal with, think about conservation tillage. Well, what's that? There's a lot of definitions. Mine is, stay in the top two inches. Don't go any deeper than Vertical tillage is a big one we've seen a lot of talk about. You know, I think a lot of those tools are really great. In fact, I've seen a lot of my no-till guys adopting these vertical tillage tools. I think you can do it with a disc as long as you're not going too deep. 
Uh, my mentor used to do a rotovator, these rototillers. Now that's a tool where you stick that sucker way, way down in the ground. You can really shatter that soil down eight inches deep if you want. But if you're running two inches deep, you know, I think that, I think that works pretty well. You know, we've been talking about this since 1943, basically since Edward Faulkner said the plow is a bad idea. And, you know, they all get it done with a disc. And if you've never read Plowman's Folly, you should read it. It's awesome. I love it. Lots of books. Here's the other take mail message. If the dirt's flying, the critters are dying. So, you know, the, the less we can we can throw that dirt up in the air, the less we can practice recreational tillage, the better. You know, you need to do something with big horsepower, get into pulling or race stock cars, get on your snowmobile, do something else. This is the manure discussion, you know. Like you said, the, the games are are something I think that really are, for, are, are at the forefront of people's minds a lot. However, there is a no-till exception in the GAMS, page 30. You can just apply manure in this state. You do not have to incorporate it. I'm not saying you necessarily want to not incorporate, but it is legal. And if we're going out there, we're applying when the soil is relatively dry, if we're using drainage water management, so we can block up those tiles and stop them from flowing during the manure application. I think there are ways to, to, to get that manure out there and disposed of that do not involve having to get in there, shatter the macro force, and do all that damage in the soil. I think we can start thinking, especially in larger operations, about solid separation. Peel the solid separate the solid fraction off, maybe a compost that and target that to your lower testing fields. So you can irrigate those liquids on during the high summer period and the corn crop actually can use so that some of that could uh, good nutrients. Um, I would encourage you if you're going to you know, target uh, the, the, this manure application and you're not going to incorporate it to run the manure, uh, what is that, RA, manure application risk index. Relatively simple calculation is basically the slope, the texture, things like that. You can kind of figure out where you can put manure without running off very effectively. This is, uh, you know, it takes a lot to blow my mind with a new concept in agriculture. But this one did it for me the other day. Why not, if we're going to put tile, then put it in on the contour. So we keep that tile all on the same elevation. And now instead of just being a drainage system, that's a sub irrigation system. That's a way to put, you know, that liquid fraction of manure on in the high summer, right from the right root, so right from the crop means it without any disturbance at all. Uh, this agri company uh, out of Illinois is actually doing the design uh, in Michigan right now, and I'll tell you what, those guys are hot to talk to have a field day. So if we, uh, if, if, if you see the system going in, you can bet that your conservation district will be getting in touch with you to have a good field day. Uh, a couple of things to look at here. This is actually how these guys do the uh, do the drainage water management. Uh, and they use a round. These are round thing instead of a square thing, so it doesn't warp, which is kind of cool. Uh, this little thing is, is the stop log in there, and that allows you to regulate the height of that, uh, that drainage water. So once you've got it planted in the springs, you cram those stop logs in there. Now the tile stops draining. Now, how many of you would have liked it if your tile could have stopped draining the minute you were done planting this past year? I think it would have been kind of a nice thing to have, even on the clay. I know the clay hung in there pretty good, but it could have hung in better. You can also put little irrigation lines right in there. You can sub irrigate with, uh, with some fertilizer as well. So lots of advantages to that. Nutrient management. Man, we got a lot of cool tools for nutrient management these days. This is uh, this is an iPhone uh, for 99 bucks on the i on the. Apple Store now, you can get this app, it'll send you this pink piece of paper, and now you take a picture of your corn leaf and it tells you whether that corn leaf is deficient in nitrogen or not. <laughs> you can also put a sensor system right on your side dress bar or on your sprayer that again is going to read the color of that crop, see if you're nitrogen deficient, and apply a little more nitrogen. I think this is huge for no-till conversion because now we're going to get ahead of that yield drag issue because you know, the bugs are sucking up all that nitrogen to build more bugs. And we're going to put on enough nitrogen to, to deal with that yield drag, and we're also going to maximize our yields of corn. So I think this is going to be big. Um, talk to, I kind of hinted at cation balance a little before. Cations are those positively charged ions that cling to the soil. 
And this is a little controversial, but I think it, it gets less controversial all the time. If you can get that base saturation, in other words, the, the amount of that soil cat, that, that soil uh, coli, that's saturated with calcium, up around 75-80% on a clay soil, that really does a lot to help chemically open that soil structure up. Um, high magnesium levels, you know, we, we know at very high levels that it makes the soil very hard. You can keep it around that 12 to 15% level on clay. You need to go a little higher on sand just to make sure you're not magnesium deficient in sand. No, of course, you want anyway, so who cares? And potassium, I'd like to see 5% or less. Out west, we also need sodium to think about. We really don't have a lot of problems with sodium in Michigan, but you know, if you're heading out west to be a farmer, you might want to think about that too. Uh, gypsum is an excellent source uh, of this material. It's calcium sulfate. It's much more soluble than lime. Some people think of gypsum as a substitute for lime. It's, it's about 400 times as soluble, so that calcium gets out into the soil a lot quicker. Uh, one of the things to do if you are going to uh, apply gypsum, you may want to credit yourself with some displaced calcium and magnesium because they're going to get kicked off the soil profile. That, you know, if you're going to put a gypsum application down, you know you've got a fair bit of potassium anyway. I wouldn't spread potassium that year. You're probably going to have plenty. Uh, we don't see a lot of dolomitic lime in Michigan that's more to the west of us where that's kind of a predominant lime, but I would not apply dolomite, especially to a clay soil, unless I knew I needed magnesium. This is kind of how this works. The calcium is actually going to draw those clay particles together, leaving more room for pore space to develop. Uh, magnesium, and to a greater degree, uh, potassium and sodium will actually bond a lot of water in there. That does what's called dispersing the clay. It really kind of it, it reduces the soil's ability to form those open pores. And again, there's lots of reading online about this kind of stuff. There's a lot of other kind of neat stuff coming down, down the pipe and a lot of things I'd like to think about. You know, I used to worry a lot more about salt index than I do now, and I used to worry a lot more about anhydrous ammonia than I do now. I'm, I'm getting a little less worried about them than I used to be. But I, I think when we're thinking about, you know, kind of the next step, we may want to think about how much chloride we're putting down, which is basically kind of useless, not that good for plant root growth. Uh, and the, the the fact that anhydrous ammonia, when we inject it directly, is very hydrophilic, which means basically it's going to suck the water out of any of the soil life that's near it and probably kill it. Does it kill it enough to make a difference? You know, I think the jury's kind of out on that one, but something to think about. Uh, I think we need to think about if we're, especially in that transition phase, maybe we don't want to pop for that $20,000 uh, know, sensor on the bar, on the uh, side dressing toolbar. Can we balance our highly soluble and less soluble forms of nitrogen if we're going to put it down side dressing? Uh, something like ammonium sulfate or coated urea that's, that's a little less soluble. You may want to, especially if you're going to try to put it all down at once, put some of these less soluble forms down. Maybe have uh, nitrogen stabilizers as well. Um, there's a lot of different technologies that can help us decide how much uh, to side dress, and even things like street bars versus nozzles. You know, street bars kind of make big drops if we're putting it on with the sprayer so it doesn't burn the foliage as much, especially on wheat. Um, I think there's, we can use our mapping and our yield goals to, to do some variable rate application and sensors, I think, of the future. Um, we can also look at electromagnetic uh, um, sensors. As you see more micronutrient deficiencies emerge. How does the sensor, a, nitro, a sensor measuring nitrogen, how can it determine the difference between yellow and corn because of a micronutrient deficiency and nitrogen deficiency? I guess we're starting to ask that question. Well, I think it's a good question to ask. Um, and you have a better answer than I'm going to have. Well, we, I've got a farmer that. He's got the green seed for the Integra on the things, and, and you make a calibrated pass like if you're going on wheat, right? Or if you're going into a corn, because varieties will be different. So, so basically, one of the first things you do is you go in and you make a pass just as a calibration pass to to, to gauge the chlorophyll, the greenness in it. So then, then, it, then you set the rates on that. 
Yeah, my, my understanding is that pass you want to make to what they call a nitrogen rich strip. So basically, you, you sock the nitrogen to one strip, you go in and calibrate it based on that, figuring that that's nitrogen saturated, and then you come back and on your other strips, you'll. You know, you'll but the base. assumption is then that stuff that is lower in nitrogen is going to be lighter green. Right. But it could be lighter green because of micronutrients also. It, it could be, but I think the idea is that if, if you were going to have that yellowing because of something else, you'd see that in your nitrogen enriched strip as well. And I, you know, I, I don't think these things are perfect, and certainly one of the things we were hearing at the National No-Till Conference is sometimes you've got you to trick the system a little bit. And you got to you gotta, you know, tweak around with the dials. I, I think a lot of this stuff is in its kind of early stages, and we're going to have questions like that that we've got to answer over time. There may be some things that we need to think about, like these, these micronutrient deficiencies. You know, I think the, the way to avoid that, really, though, is to, when you're taking your soil tests, you know, test for zinc, test for iron. Maybe we need to do some tissue testing to see if we're deficient in some of these things. And try to address that so that we're not having to, you know, spoof the nitrogen system at, at some point in order to get it done. A couple other things to think about. Uh, sometimes we, we see these different uh, micronutrient concoctions out there for sale. I would really emphasize sulfate-based trace mineral formulations because we know they're, sulfate, they're, they're pretty soluble, where oxides are pretty darn insoluble. Uh, drainage water management, I think, can be big for keeping that, those nutrients in the water in the uh, root zone. And there's just crazy things, like can we throw a little clay in our sand? Can we add these polyethylene membranes? This is something they came up with at Michigan State. Let's cram a little piece of plastic down into these sandy soils that catches the water going down and stops all the water from running through the sandy soil. I'll tell you what, that got my attention because I'm on low sand. I think compaction management is huge, and I think we've got great tools to deal with it. I think most people are familiar with the guidance systems at this point. Uh, you know, staying the heck off wet soils is still working very effectively after all these years. Uh, I think a lot of times we're planting too early. And unless you've got a bajillion acres to get over, I think, uh, you know, what my mentor used to say is every corn farmer ought to have a boat to sit in it just as long as they can stand in the spring. And then when they just can't stand it anymore, then they go on and plant. I think 2011 was a good object lesson than that. Most of you guys were kept out of the fields for an awfully long time. You know, our yields weren't too darn bad on the back side of that. Um, I think there's other things. You don't want to spring for GPS. Certainly, you know, I, I know guys who used to groove with, a, uh, with their planters. They'd have a place to drop the front tire in. They very accurately get over the same thing every time. Uh, I think just leaving a little wider space that you can see to get over the same, you know, there's a lot of ways to get it done. Uh, tracks are certainly a good way to get your compaction done, and also just looking at, at your tire pressure. You know, if you don't own a tire gauge, you are asking for trouble. Uh, I think grain carts. Uh, grain carts, I'm not that thrilled with, honestly. I, I think we might have made a, a small error of judgment when we got rid of all those those lighter uh, gravity boxes that favored these giant grain carts. Because man, those things can really mash down the soil. Uh, I think if you've got a lot of manure to apply, you really can't beat having a drag line as opposed to all those tanks. Uh, this was a little compaction I, I took some pictures of this year. Uh, and of course, what we did to fix that is we chiseled it when it was wet. So it, it amazes me that these mistakes are made over and over again. But, you know. There's kind of two ways to break up compaction in the subsoil. Uh, we can do it mechanically. Put some big iron in there, get under it, try to fracture it. Uh, if we're not patient, again, and we try to do it when the soil's too wet, uh, we're just putting that compaction down deeper, maybe making a bigger hash of it than it already is. You know, we don't get as many difficult situations as you do further south where they get fragile pan, but we do get some soils uh, that actually will form a chemical hard pan, and there's not a heck of a lot to do about that. I kind of like biological subsoil. When we're getting in there with a deep root cover crop or a deep root crop and trying to break that compaction with, with the roots. It's not universally possible. You know, they, we sometimes do see these things where the crop roots go down, they get a hard pan, and they split out of there. But it's 
some of these some of these cover crops can really get it done. Annual ryegrass is a real stand out there. Tillage radishes have been very popular because nine times out of ten it drops dead for you in the spring. Good old sweet clover does a pretty good job too. I think we can talk about uh, the right equipment for no-till. I think this is one guys miss a lot. Are we spreading the residue evenly? And that includes the chaff. Or is that stuff kind of just working out the back of the combine? Not only is that going to be uh, an issue for the soil being cooler, for being difficult to plant, but we're redistributing fertility into these narrower and narrower bands. We're getting things all out of whack. You know, then we go back and we pay for grid sampling to try to get it all straightened out again. Better if we can get that, that spread real well. Um, I think this Redicop chopper is pretty awesome. You know, not only do you have these big fans, but you chop it up pretty good out there. A lot of interest in processing corn heads. Uh, some of these are pretty beastly heavy and high horsepower things. I'm kind of a fan of these uh, Calmer, Harry Calmer's chopping rollers in there. Really doesn't uh, add a lot of horsepower. Um, one of the suggestions I saw is hang a camera off the back of the combine. And that way you can kind of have a look and you can see what's going on back there rather than just kind of guessing. Um, let's think about wind direction. You know, if you're going uh, up and down the field this way and the wind's going 40 miles an hour across your thing, you are not spreading residue evenly. You need to either turn and go the other way, or you need to be patient and wait for a while. Uh, you know, planting, I mean, that's a talk all by itself, but the wonderful thing is we got a lot of different things to hang off that planter these days. to assist with getting that seed in the ground and getting it done. Um, and I think the maintenance is huge. You can't stand getting in the shop doing the maintenance. Take it to the dealer. Have the bushings checked over. You know, is that row wandering around back there because your bushings are all worn out? Are your coulters sharp enough and, and adjusted properly to get in there? And again, there's, there's a ton of information on, on out there on how to do it. A couple other things to think about if you're upgrading. I would have row clutches. But, you know, it really allows you to, to precision plant. It'll save you money on seeds. You know, it'll get you some yield on the other side because you're not over planting in places. Um, and I think we don't get off the tractor enough and see what's really going on. You know, let's get back there and see if it's really working like we think it's, it's working. Um, and we're talking about that. I think we're kind of in, one of the reasons we're in this golden age of crop production is because we've got so much information we can use to, to really dial in our system. Uh, grid sampling, everybody's pretty familiar with. Electrical conductivity testing is where we essentially put a couple of sensors in, out in the soil and we run a current between them and we see how much electricity is passing through. That gives you a pretty good idea of your fertility levels and I think over time we're going to see more and more of this done on the fly. We're also getting more compaction sensors where there's a little coulter up there and there's something reading how hard is that soil and adjusting the ground the down pressure in real time to react to the, the compaction as we detect it. Um, we've got better and better mapping technologies, LIDARs where we use a laser rangefinder to make a highly accurate map of the surface, uh, and a lot of your GPS systems will also make a, a good contour map. And I think that's huge. I think we could do more with that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the crop sensors. Uh, some guys are going out. They're burying sensors in the soil to, to look at moistures and whole networks of sensors to look at the moisture and, and very accurately reading the moisture status of the crop. Um, variable application's been around for a while, um, but also think about variable crop production or variable uh, populations. And also maybe even variable amounts of herbicides, and again in response to uh, weed pressure as it's detected with sensors. Uh, we're seeing systems where we can actually have a variable spray mix going across the field. You know, it dials in a little more atrazine, dials it back when you don't need it, things like that. And we're seeing systems where you can actually have two different hybrids loaded up in the in the planter at once. And in Michigan, where you know every five feet you got a different soil, that may be something to think about. You know, can we put offensive hybrids on our heavier soils as we're going across the fields, or defensive hybrids, you know, on our lower yielding soil? You know, what's next? You know, good question. And there's all kinds of interesting things uh, going on. Uh, many of our dealers are coming up to speed on this stuff. I know I'm talking to more local guys at Fillmore, they're certainly looking at more and more things. 
And you know, certainly maybe you don't want to pony up for that $20,000 green seeker system, but if your side dressing is being done by the co-op, I think it's time to ask those guys, do you have green seeker, do you know how to run it, and will you run it for my fields? And this is just the coolest thing ever, as far as I'm concerned. We have uh, in our pockets, everybody's got these cell phones now, there's more computer power on the cell phone you carry around than we used to put a man on the moon in the 60s. And on the chips we've got now, we've got a tilt sensor, we've got a velocity sensor. It's all integrated into these chips and a GPS sensor. Well, you can take that brain out of your smartphone, you can whack it into one of these little autonomous drones, and congratulations, you got basically a self-flying aircraft. Uh, and it costs all of 20 bucks now for this chip. Um, so there's, there's increasingly, basically, no skill, special skill needed to fly these drone aircraft. You just tell it where you want to go, and it goes out there and maps it for you. Uh, Japan, as usual, is kind of up front on this. There's 2,300 drone helicopters working in Japan, and they're not just reading the field conditions, they're spraying with these things. At this point, there's 30% of the rice is sprayed by, sprayed by drones, and they've basically driven manned spray units right out of business. Uh, our current FAA rules are kind of restrictive. You basically got to stay under 400 feet right now, but Congress has kind of given them a, a little kick in the hiney, and they've got to make some new rules by 2015. Don't be afraid to call your congressman and tell them you want to fly your drone aircraft over the fields, and so we ought to do something about that. Uh, 21 universities in this country are working on this stuff, and it's all basically about remote sensing for ag. And the manufacturers of these drone aircraft are, are really getting excited about ag because there's only so many drone aircraft you can sell to the military and the cops. So they'll be coming looking for you sooner rather than later. Uh, what should you be thinking about for soil health education? There's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, NRCS has a national priority to look at, at soil health. Uh, and I think that's going to come down. I think more and more of our conservation districts are, are interested in this. In fact, I'm going to go give this talk in Shiawassee in a couple of days. MSU Extension is coming along. SARE is a national program that, that has kind of been out there for a long time, trying a bunch of interesting new things. And there's, there's just a tremendous amount of information on their website for about 50 years of research. Um, No-Till Farmer, I think, is great. And if you're not a subscriber to this magazine, you ought to be. And if you can't stand the 30 bucks a year or whatever it is, most of their stuff ends up online pretty quickly. You can, you can read it for free there. Lots of private consultants talking about this. We've got some groups we're going to work on this summer to do peer-to-peer -peer education on this. And Google's out there. And don't just stop at Google. Fire a Google Scholar if you really want some depth on this. This is kind of, you have to kind of dig through their, their, their menus to get to this, but Google Scholar is just about looking at scholarly articles, so university papers on these subjects. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not just kind of the, the, I don't know, sustainable fringe of agriculture talking about this. This is the latest issue of Corn and Soybean Digest. Not exactly a radical bunch of people. They got about a 10-page article on what they're calling the Brown Revolution, which wouldn't be my first choice for a term, but, you know, whatever. Uh, but, this, this is really a hot topic in agriculture right now, and I think it kind of reflects the future. This is something we're doing. We call it the Soil Health Working Group. Bob was nice enough to host one for us last year. We had three meetings. Uh, we did a kind of a pure no-till farm. Bob's more of a conservation tillage guy. We did an organic farm because they asked us to come over, so we went over. Um, I modeled it on pasture walkers, those of you who are grazers may know, or farmers get together and they talk to each other about what they do. Um, we, we kind of do it in three sections. We, well, basically, I interrogate the farmer for what I call 20 questions, which as many questions as I can think of, and then the farmers ask each other questions. We do a little walk and talk where we look at the equipment that the farm is using and how they get it done, plans for the future, and we always dig a hole and see what's really going on down in the soil, because that, that's kind of where the rubber hits the road, and that's what we've got to do. The goal is to share. Let's share our methods. Let's talk about the tools we use. And actually, one of these uh, pasture logs I know, they used to get together and compare, compare financials every year. Now, you know, maybe that's not something we're all comfortable with doing, but boy, I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, as far as I'm concerned, sustainability starts with a full checking account, so something to think about. We put everything we did last year up on YouTube, so you can have a look at it. Uh, 
We went to the Jimmy Smothergan firm, Jim and Jimmy Smothergan. We got a couple other long-term no-till guys there. We had a great panel by them. Uh, again, it's something I encourage you to look at it, it, on YouTube. And kind of the take-home messages, corn on corn, it's really tough. You know, you got to do something to, to deal with those residues. Uh, you got to run that sprayer. You really don't have time to wait for weed control. Um, good planting starts with good harvesting. We kind of hit that uh, before. And patience. Be patient. Do not mash that, that good structure that you're building out of there. Uh, Bob's a very interesting guy, one of the more innovative farmers I've, I've run into over the years. Uh, very much data driven. Uh, got himself down 4,000 sows and still ships the same number of pigs, which I thought was phenomenal. Uh, a couple of take home messages the, the real value of rain tile, uh, the value of shallow tillage rather than deeply injecting manure. Uh, Bob's not one of those guys complaining about too much residue. And I think that really speaks volumes about, about keeping that soil biology up. Uh, we visited the Bronco farm. Uh, I think we could say that the biggest challenges in organic agriculture are weeds, weeds, and weeds. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty darn difficult to manage weeds on an organic farm. Buy some gloves. Uh, like I said, it's all up on YouTube. You can find us at West Michigan Conservation. Uh, this is kind of the views we've had. We've had that up about six months, and everybody's really interested in what Bob does. So lots of views on that. The take home messages there. Find so many high profile out yeah, there. Each of them. Uh, lots of reading out there. This book is really tremendous, and I, I can't recommend it enough. It's actually written by a guy down in South America. South American no till adoption approaches 70%, or it's more like 20% on a good day in the United States. And I think a lot of that is they've, they've had some real leadership early on in that. They also get a little more rain, a little more worn out soils. This is another great one. This is basically a column that's run in the no-till farmer for years and years. Uh, it's just, just profiles of farmers. And the nice thing about this is you can read about farmers in your area, and also out of the area, just see the different way, ways people got in different challenges they will overcome over time. Uh, just a few words on scouting, you know, dig some holes. See what's really going on in your soil a couple of times a year. I think it's it's time well spent. Uh, I like to try to lay out the profile as I'm going along. You can use a knife to kind of slide it up through the soil and see if you've got compacted layers in there. Or you can, you know, make yourself a little T-handled uh, tile probe and go probing for compaction that way. Uh, Look at the pores. I like to give it a sniff test. Can I, can I smell a little bit of nitrogen, ammonia smell in that soil? That, I think that's a good thing. If I smell a lot of it, you know, maybe not as good. Does it have that earthy smell like a forest soil does? Or does it just kind of smell like mineral dirt? Not a terribly scientific method, but yeah, works for you. Uh, We'll talk about uh, slaking tests as we go in here. Uh, Paul actually has brought along some soil to do a slaking test, so we're going to demonstrate that uh, since we're running late. I'm going to skip over. So, in summation, what's the best way to get there? Continuous no-till. And fellas, beans are not continuous no-till. If you're going back and you're chiseling every time ahead of corn or after corn or any of that, it's, it's not no-till. It's not enough. Uh, cover crops fly it on if you can't get out there, if you don't have the time, uh, if you're harvesting late. I think compaction management is huge. You need to think about some kind of compaction management. You need to get out there and deal with it with cotton, with uh, cover crops or steel, or you need to just not create it in the first place. Um, balance fertility, look at your micronutrients. If you've never tested for micronutrients, for goodness sakes, run the test. Either test the soil or do some leaf testing and see where you're actually at. Um, and I think sweating the detail is important. Can we use crop sensors? Can we get that $99 application from, uh, you know, for your uh, iPhone? You know, if you got a bigger farm, maybe you need to think about crop sensors. You don't want to spring for crop sensors? You know, maybe the, maybe the co-op will do it for you. I think narrow rows are big. Kind of a bad pun, but... Um, I really think the future of corn is going to be in the range of 15 to 22 inches. Probably more toward 15, in my opinion. Um, beans, you know, we've been narrow row beans for a while. I don't think anybody needs a lot of convincing on that. 
One interesting thing I've seen with beans a lot of black guys are kind of dialing back their population and it doesn't seem to be hurting them. And that kind of makes sense to me. You know, beans are much more flexible than our corn are. I, I, I think we might be able to save a few bucks by dialing back the, the population a little on that. This is what I got from Phil Meter. Can we go to three inch wheat? Wow, three inch wheat. Uh, you know, it's big in Europe and those guys, those are the guys who are getting up in that 200 uh, bushel range of wheat, so you know, what can we do to get there? Uh, optimum population, you know, precision planting, row clutches, well-maintained planters, I mean, all just critical. You know, wheat management's big, we're seeing more and more talk about resistance. I think, you know, I, I guess the one thing that might have fallen away from this golden era of crop production is that Roundup's not gonna get it all done all by itself anymore. You know, we really need to start thinking about resistance management. Interestingly, uh, resistance to steel hand pulling and mulch is holding steady. And okay, most of you don't want to go back to steel. Nobody wants to go to hand pulling. But mulch, I think, is something we can start thinking about a whole lot more seriously with cover cropping. And boy, I'll tell you what, you, you want to really have kind of a nightmare scenario, start talking to the people who have been dealing with Palmer Amaranth and resistance mare's tail. I mean, those weeds are coming. We've imported them up into the northern U.S. with uh, gin trash and uh, cottonseed meal, and I, you know, we're starting to see it in Michigan. And that—that's a nasty weed. That's a get off the tractor and pull that sucker weed. Um, so maybe if we could get that, that level of mulch up there, we could fill those niches up with with closer row spacing and all that. Maybe we can get ahead of some of these resistant weeds. Another thing we're seeing—I mean, I really you know, kind of beat the dead horse with this this no-till thing, but, you know, these farmers who have been doing it for a while, who build up that level of mulch on the surface of the soil, they do not have the numbers of weeds to deal with, the guys who are going in and stirring those weed seeds up every year. I think water management's big, you know, can we, you know, do we have enough tile, and can we control that tile so it's not rotting this moisture when we don't need to? And, it, you know, we talked a little bit about tea earlier, tolerable soil loss. I hate that term. I hate it. Soil loss is intolerable. It should, it should just bug the dickens out of you to see a rough, to see a, a, a gully forming in your fields. And, and the, the gullies that we see is a tiny fraction of the soil that's actually on the move. Most of the erosion that goes on is sheet erosion caused by the impact of raindrops. If we can cover the soil, we will not have that soil on the move. The other thing is if we can get that soil structure open, if we can get the soil able to absorb that rain as it comes down, that's more yield and that's less erosion. And it sure as heck is less Sierra Club regulations, other whiners about agriculture, you know, wanting to tell you how to run your business. You know, you get on the uh, internet and you can find all kinds of great things. This is a guy from uh, Calvin College, you know, those commies at Calvin College who go on and on about environmentalism. I love this quote. I love it. You know, if we're good, good Christian, Jewish, Muslim men and women out there, by golly, you know, God handed us this beautiful earth that gave us dominion over it. Dominion does not mean we dominate. Dominion does not mean we take endlessly. Dominion means that we are the stewards of the earth. Whether or not, you know, you want to get it from the old-time religion, or you get it from the old saints of soil science there, you know, we, it is really in our hands. We are the hands that are going to build the 21st century agriculture. And I encourage you to build a 21st century agriculture that's high-yielding and where tea is a thing of the past. So, comments and questions? Now, I lay it on pretty thick there. Part of me thinks 
Strip tillage is just taking all the problems of tillage agriculture and putting it in a narrow band. So you've got, you know, a place we went in and we chewed up the soil structure in this narrow band, and then next to it we have a band where we didn't chew up that soil structure. So I think things like local hyphal networks probably suffer in strip tillage. I think depending on, you know, the, the slope orientation, we may be asking for erosion problems in strip tillage. However, you know, I do think it's a lot better than going in and chiseling the cheapers out of everything and, and, and doing it that way. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm open to seeing it work, but I'm not sure it's, it's really what we need. You know, I, I think 15, 20 years ago, when no-till was not quite ready for prime time in a lot of ways, we didn't have the wonderful equipment we've got today. I think strip tillage made a whole lot more sense because you really had to get that zone ready, you know, built and ready to go. Um, over time, as we've gotten better planters, as we better understand how to set up a planter, I think it gets less and less value. Other questions?